You know, I'm going to talk today about a guild uh, that has existed for 10,000 years, uh, making it the oldest human guild in the history of humanity. For 10,000 years, the members of this guild worked relentlessly, passionately. They worked to give us a better life. And just in the past 50 years, it was a very understated guild. It never came on the headlines. It was never in the media. But they just worked quietly for thousands of years. And just in the past 50 years, that guild has just about died out. There are so few of us left that you can literally count us on your fingertips. I'm talking about the guild of the seed keepers. <coughs> and it's important, it's imperative that we understand why this has happened. A guild that did its work so beautifully flourished for 10,000 years in the last 50 years, it's gone away, it's gone. And we don't even know about it. I mean, this is the age of big data, the cloud computing and deep dive. How did we miss this? So today's talk focuses, and it's a tribute to the golden era of seed keepers. It's also a wake up call for us why we should revive this, why you should become a part of this. So to understand why this guild was so important to us, we need to understand where we are today. You know, if I go to the vegetable market today to buy vegetables, the list would read something like this. A kilo of cabbage, a kilo of cauliflower, two kilos of tomato, blah, blah. Because the default mode today is that for a variety of vegetable, whether it's cabbage, tomato, cauliflower, whatever, there will be one variety in the one type of vegetable in the market. Cauliflower means one, one type of cauliflower. Cabbage means one type of cabbage. So that's the default. So by and large, if you go and see four colors of capsicum on the shelf, that's an exception to the rule. But just look at this slide. It was published in the July edition of 2011 in the National Geographic magazine. And it succinctly captures a research that was done by the National Center for Genetic Res uh, Resources Preservation in the US, who did a survey. This was done in 1983. Who did a survey of number of types of vegetables that were available in 1983 for 10 common vegetables, and compared it with what was there in 1903? That was 80 years before that time. What was the variety that was available? And in 1983, what was available? The shocking finding was that 93% of the biodiversity of the vegetables was lost. In 80 years, we lost 90%. The fact of the matter is, like the theme of today's TED Talk, against all odds, can we make a change? And that was the question that was there in my mind. In the 70s, uh, when I was doing my doctoral studies in agriculture, I belonged to the lineage of people like Dr. Norman Borlaug, Dr. M.S. Swaminathan, who ushered in the Green Revolution into this country. We were the ones who championed the cause of industrial agriculture. We told the farmers to adopt chemical agriculture. We told them to use DAP, urea, pesticides, and we were the ones who championed the cause of using hybrid seeds. At that time, to us, the agriculture scientists of my times, our diktat was to create national food security. That is what was our goal. To, to give due credit, I think we achieved that, but there was a small voice in me that kept asking me, are we doing the right thing? Are we is this model that you are propagating, is that a sustainable model for future agriculture? This voice wouldn't go away. It just kept getting louder and louder. And one day I decided, I said, okay, to hell with this. 
I'm going to change my field of study. I changed my field of study. And then for the rest of my profession, I practiced landscape architecture. So I went away from my original qualification. Now, the one beautiful aspect about being a landscape architect based outside the country was that I had an opportunity to reach out to very remote parts of the world. And during my travels, I used to always go and meet seed keepers, uh, the older generation of farmers. I used to go and meet them, talk to them, ask them what they used to grow in their days. I traveled to almost all the remote parts of India, many other countries, and because that seed keeping was still in their DNA, to my amazement, I found that they'd still have preserved some seeds. Like this particular brinjal is a brinjal that was so common in Bangladesh just about 20 years ago. Today, you will not find it anywhere in Bangladesh. I had visited an old farmer in the uh, border state of Purlia in West Bengal. And when I was talking to him, he shared with me an old dried up piece which still had few seeds from it. So I went, I, I kept collecting seeds. And in that, I used to share it with other seed keepers using uh, common platforms uh, with dedicated, like-minded seed keepers around the world. And whatever biodiversity that we were able to salvage, uh, I collected that. And in 2011, when I came back, I had the privilege of doing voluntary work with the uh, agriculture wing of the Art of Living Foundation that gave me access to about 2 million farmers across the country uh, to promote chemical-free farming. And when I started to work with these farmers, I realized how bad the situation of indigenous seeds was in the country. And that's when I decided to become a full-time seed keeper. I realized that I had with me um, about 540 varieties of indigenous seeds. And in the past six years, I tested them for genetic stability, environmental uh, 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 suitability, and purity, viability. And in the past six years, I've managed to actually stabilize, multiply, and share 142 varieties of vegetable seeds with friends, farmers, and urban gardeners such as you. If I show you some of the, uh, uh, let me first show you some of the pictures. Now, these are the kind of beans that you would find in uh, Hariali farms, just in Bangalore South. Uh, just see the variety. I mean, if you, if you wanted, even thought of being a vegetarian, a variety like this will get your juices trickling. Just look at these beautiful, and aren't these capsicums a beauty? I mean, they're just so beautiful. This one, I will hold it just by the stalk because it's the world's spiciest, naturally occurring pepper. This, I got this from the from Arnachal uh, in the Northeast. The ordinary chili in the market, that's about 17,000 Scoville units. That's the degree of heat. This one is 175,000, 1,75,000 Scoville units. So if I touched it with my hand, after some time, it'll burn my hand. You just look at these tomatoes. They look like grapes, don't they? Yeah? You look at these uh, peppers, such beautiful peppers, yeah? You look at, uh, I mean, this is the end of the season. Bindis. Have you seen a bindi that's that beautiful? Do you see the colors of corn? We have many, many more colors. You see these cucumbers, the one on the bottom left? This was called dosaka. Till about 30, 40 years ago, it was very freely available in North Karnataka, Andhra, uh, drier parts of Andhra. It is a crunchy apple-shaped cucumber with a lemon flavor. You have the one next to that and the bottom row, the middle bottom row, this they call alu kakdi in the northeast, uh, northeastern states. It's a cucumber, which has got a very subtle flavor. You have the other one, which is on the right-hand top corner. This was called puna kakri. It was very famous. These were very famous. Today, you will not find these varieties in the market. 
And the beauty is, if you just have one seed, you can make a thousand seeds and share it with your friends. In fact, uh, let me just quickly show you some more. Just look at the variety of tomatoes. Those were the different kind of bindis, purple bindis, pink bindis, white bindis, all kinds of bindis. Look at the kinds of squashes. You want to have leaf in your diet, then you ha we have got more than 23 varieties of lettuces and mustards, all indigenous, desi. Farmers also use this as a high revenue income stream. In fact, I have one farmer right here. Varun, where are you? Yeah. This techie boy took a sabbatical from his IoT space for two years to do hands-on Mannina Maga work, hardcore agriculture. And he sold this. He sold these tomatoes at 300 rupees a kilo because he was a man who knew how to market it. He had a storyboard and he gave the full nine yards spiel and he had people lapping it out of his hand at 300 rupees a kilo. A farmer, if he gets 20 rupees a kilo in the best of times, he will celebrate. And, you know, you can make a business model like that. Now, the urban enthusiasts were, were another species altogether. Women grew, especially women, home gardeners, they grew this vegetables, exotic vegetables, and they found that it had a huge social media potential. Women started posting pictures of, this is a Japanese Kamo brinjal, one of the tastiest brinjals that you can find. Imagine 1,000 likes on Facebook. That's what you garner with that. You would put it on Twitter and you put it on Instagram. I've had people hold kitty parties just for the lady of the house to display these wonderful vegetables which she has grown at home. But Beneath all that, take away the Twitter, the Instagram, the, the Flickr and whatever. There is a very deep service that the urban population is doing because they are ensuring somewhere on this planet, these varieties will not go extinct. We can't do about the 540, we can't do anything about the 544 cabbages that went away. But at least we can save these. So it is important that you and I get together and we somehow create another new age of the seed keepers and we make a statement that seeds belong to all mankind. No company, no individual can have a proprietary right in them. So I urge you, just because you can experience that wonderful consciousness of the seed keepers, let's give each other a wonderful round of applause. Thank you.